In 2014, Plutopian Maggie Duval produced a great EFF Austin party and event called Cyberpunk 2014 Retrofest during South by Southwest. A highlight of the event was a panel about cyberpunk. It featured science fiction authors Bruce Sterling, Cory Doctorow, and Christopher Brown, and editor Gareth Branwin, who in the 1990s assembled the hypercard stack Beyond Cyberpunk. I was the moderator. Bruce was an important author in the cyberpunk subgenre of science fiction. Corey and Chris came later, but like so many more recent sci-fi authors, were both influenced by the high-tech, low-life ethos of cyberpunk. Gareth was a consumer and critic of cyberpunk fiction. This panel threw a lot of sparks, and we're happy to present this recording of it. Many times I think, you know, cyberpunk kind of killed the future. It sort of killed that Tomorrowland idea of the future that we had, you know, in a, in a different realm before it was before the 80s. That uh, now it's so kind of deeply infiltrated the culture and that it's really just kind of getting going in terms of this really user-driven iteration of culture. Um, and one where, you know, network culture, I'm now starting to think, you know, it's really just starting to kind of infiltrate big pyramidal institutions of the society in ways that we can't even imagine what the future is going to look like in the very near sense as, you know, money and all of the big systems of trust and institutions of trust are replaced with distributed math. And, uh, and, you know, what's going to happen is that kind of infiltrates the legal system and, uh, and so on. Let's, let's hear from Gareth. Gareth was uh, not only uh, uh, a consumer of cyberpunk and a writer about cyberpunk, but he is a cyberpunk. <laughs> Well, yeah, which which dovetails nicely. Yeah, I was going to say uh, I don't I don't write science fiction, so I can't speak to that aspect of cyberpunk. But I can speak to the sort of real world, uh, the folks that were influenced by cyberpunk. And I think what happened with a lot of cyberpunks is that they became makers. Um, I think when you look at the in, in the eighties and nineties, there was this whole sort of meditation fixation, whatever, on the idea of mentality. Uh, programming bits over atoms, uh, the idea of you, you know, your brain swimming out into the matrix and all that. It was a very dreamy, very uh, mental, mentally obsessive way of looking at at, at a, a, this uh, sort of an escape reality. Uh, and so all of my friends were programmers and hackers, but it was not physical stuff. It wasn't hardware. I got into hardware in the late '80s through the Forrest Mims book, uh, Getting Started with Electronics. Um, and uh, and so I started hardware hacking like way before most of my friends did. And the, the idea that you would actually like open up your computer and and replace things was so foreign to these friends of mine who were these genius, you know, software hackers. But the idea of uh, physically soldering or whatever, they had no interest in that. Uh, but slowly, people started becoming interested in it. And I think there was this sort of oscillation between the the mentality of cyberpunk and then this sort of physicality of the maker movement. And then things like, you know, microcontrollers became cheaper and it was more ex accessibility to hardware that was fun and easy and, and very accessible. Mark Fraunfeller actually said a really awesome thing once, which he said that in terms of this idea of, of all of a sudden geeks uh, founding hacker spaces and, and maker fairs and all that, um, you know, he said, when you, when you, make, when you hack, Software, you just email the, or or send people a you know IP address or whatever to your creation. But when you physically make stuff, you got to get together with people and actually show them the stuff that you make. And so I think that impulse, once people started doing hardware hacking, there was this sort of shift. And and also that idea of now you know now wanting to get your, you've gotten you've gotten your head dirty for a long time. Now you want to get your hands dirty again. You want to go back to to atoms. You want to go back to physical shit. Um, but now I think it's interesting because I think like this event, I've been thinking for a while now that there's going to be that sort of nostalgic wave where people of a certain age are going to start being nostalgic for the period of their youth. And so I think we're now seeing cyberpunk, zine culture, which I was really involved in, mail art, all that stuff from the late, early eight, from the late 80s, early 90s is now starting to be 
emerging again as being popular, and I think we're going to see this sort of wave of nostalgia. So I think maybe the pendulum might swing back in the other uh, direction. But anyway, I think a lot of cyberpunks in the real world uh, became makers. So. Bruce. Okay. Um, well, how uh, do I put this? I, mean, I think there's a, a kind of grand roll of the seasons there, where you have people who are metaphysicians or literary or philosophy or theorists or, or futurists, and they have to talk in a very elaborate and detached kind of way because the things they're trying to describe just don't have any material form. And it's not possible to talk about them in a practical, hands-on, design-centric method of affordances. But then you get popular cults and kind of groups of early adapters who are taking some of these inchoate ideas and kind of barely there notions and trying to bring them into reality and live them. And then there's a further period where some of that stuff gets popular attraction in terms of the consumer items and real capacity to do stuff. And at that point, all this sort of metaphysical romance gets knocked off of it, and the language changes entirely. So it's very easy to get upset by those transitions. Instead of say, well, gosh, you know, this cyberpunk said it was all about minds meeting themselves in the Barlovian noosphere. <laughs> and, you know, that certainly sounds ridiculous to me and my wife whom I met on Facebook. <laughs> you know, which is which is kind of sad, you know, but but actually, you know, there 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 are transitions in rhetoric that actually act as kind of safety fuses or kind of blow lines or you know, just kind of no man's lands or burned out districts where people agree that it's no longer science fiction. And you, you can no longer talk about it as if it were science fiction. So, you know, we're in a world that's absolutely surrounded with stuff that would have been the ideal in cyberpunk novels, sort of worse than cyberpunk novels, at, at, their, at, their, at their most morbid in many ways. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm genuinely upset by what happened to Ross Ulbricht and what Ross did with, uh, with Silk uh, Road. Because, uh, you know, here's a kid who could have been an EFF Austin member very easily. He's very bright, he's a political obsessive, he understands how to code, he has unorthodox political insights that are very deeply held. Uh, he happens to be of the contemporary Tea Party libertarian white instead of the 1980s daffy nosebleed postmoderns, whatever stuff we were into. But he's absolutely <laughs> a person of our demographic who is also a major league narcotics criminal. Just, you know, a horrifying underground criminal figure who, who plotted the death of six different people. Uh, without ever having a single criminal stain on his record, you know, he, he just he, he came out of this imaginary Bitcoin wonderland with, without ever being arrested for so much as a traffic violation, as I can figure, and you know, just involved himself in this this horrendous consensual hallucination of of, of trading narcotics and guns and any possible forbidden thing for this digital pseudo-currency and this trading platform, which came out of nowhere, you know, and it's like a completely cyberpunk idea. I mean, you can go and look at it and just, oh yeah, you know, privatized currencies. I mean, you know, it's very Cory Doctorow, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the sort of thing I would write about. And then there's Eric Brown. Eric Brown, ladies and gentlemen, you know, whose show trial is going on right now. Thank goodness the EFF managed to get to get the ferocious Dallas prosecutors to drop some of the, you know, impossible and horrifying legal charges against this guy. I mean, basically he's looking at a century in jail because he was the self-appointed PR guy for Anonymous. You know, and Barrett's like this Dallas hippie who writes for the underground press. No human being in any federal position of authority can tell this guy from me with a microscope. We look just the same. We act just the same. He happens to be, I don't know, maybe 30 years younger than me, literally half my age. 
He, he's, right, he's trying to do the same sort of thing I did with Hacker Crackdown when I was writing about the Secret Service raiding Steve Jackson games there in Austin. But instead of me, who like wrote this book, which was like a critic's darling book, made me famous, they emptied a truckload of money on my lawn after I publicized the Steve Jackson case game. This guy's looking like a century in the slam for appointing himself as, you know, uh, the, 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 the First Amendment shield of, of, of anonymous, you know, who are sinister people. They're not your friends. You don't know who they are. They're not freaking Robin Hood and anonymous. You know, and yet he nevertheless somehow imagined that these guys are going to be the American equivalent of like the Egyptian uprising. That was, there's some kind of Twitter revolution which is going to like sweep away the problems of American society. They fell on him like a surgical bone hammer. He's in the slammer right now for just writing articles for the underground press. He's in there writing stuff from his prison. He's doing book reviews. He used to call me on the phone there for now. Oh, love the book, Mr. Sterling. Okay, that's not the kind of thing that I would have hoped would have happened from this kind of political involvement that I had with the EFF. But boy, is it ever cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're roasting this guy. They're going to send him up the river as hard as they possibly can, not because he did any particular severe crime, but just because they don't want to see more people like him. He's like more trouble than his work, right? And he's being like, Slam in a very heavy duty and effective fashion. I don't think they're going to let him out of prison merely because, well, not only did he befriend Anonymous, which he should never have done, and not only did he threaten a federal cop on YouTube, which is not a very journalistic thing to do, <laughs> frankly, but he also passed a hidden tripwire when he fucked over Stratfor and started revealing all their connections to these interior beltway guys, all these J Trig characters. All these other spooks, the grassroots people, the, the, you know, the, the astroturf groups that are in there trying to screw with the internet, uh, you know, and, and, and practicing uh, you know, the methods of, uh, of cyber war deception. It was that, I mean, that's the reason why he's like, he's, he's persona non grata. You know, it's not just that he's like a hippie with a bad attitude. He's a hippie with a bad attitude in a very unfriendly political period. It's just not the same as it was when I was doing this stuff. You know, and I look at that stuff and I saw her. I'm, I'm sorry for Ulbricht. I'm sorry for Ulbricht's mom. I'm glad he didn't kill the six people. I don't know how many people took these narcotics the guy was selling, how many dead people came up from Ross and his machinations. Now, Barrett did foolish things. I don't think he belongs in prison. He should have been reprimanded in some way. Out of, but, you know, these are people who are the exact contemporary equivalent of the sort of stuff that was going on 30 years ago. And they're Austinites, which is the word. And I, <laughs> even, and I won't even get started on this character with his fucking Liberator 3D printed gun. Uh, no, I don't even want to mention his name. But the mere fact that people are 3D printing untraceable handguns in Austin with the line, made in Austin, stenciled on the barrel by 3D printing thing, it's a public shame. You know, it's a dreadful business. And to call such a thing a liberator is like, well, I don't know, I understand why he did it. I mean, he's trying to make a particular political point. He's very good at doing it. But um, this is a heritage of contemporary cyberpunk. They're not punk. They wouldn't call themselves cyberpunk. But they're people who are in the same situation, in the same city, just at a different point of time. It's not good. I mean, right. And you know, eventually, you have to say hi to a real bone hammer. <laughs> So there's a there's a kind of revisionist history of the early years of technology activism that goes that, that talks about a kind of boundless naive utopianism of the people who in their early 90s and late 80s began to get exercised about the law and policy related to technology and networks and it, it's this idea that the internet was going to make everybody freer and happier and and, and was going to solve all of our problems, and that it wouldn't give rise to any problems. And in fact, it's kind of hard to reconcile that with founding activist groups whose mission was to stamp out incipient problems arising from 
bad uses, bad policies, bad directions and technology. Why would you found the cypherpunks movement and try to legalize access to strong crypto if you didn't think that without the ability to keep secrets in a networked world, ubiquitous surveillance would become the norm, right? That, that, that's why it existed. So there's this kind of, of um, way of, of, uh, of talking about this stuff today where you say, you know, we smart, serious people who come from inside the beltway and, and don't use terms like disruptive as, a, as a positive terms, we, we, you know, people out of the policy wonk circle are grown-ups and understand that this technology stuff has uh, dual uses and that it doesn't just free people, it also puts them into slavery and makes corporations bigger and makes them ag de facto agents of the state because not only can they collect enormous amounts of information about us, but then they can have that information in turn harvested by, by governments, and not just friendly, cuddly gov governments, whoever those might be, but, but also governments that you might not like. Yeah, yeah, not, not yeah, the, the horrible, sinister governments like the Danes. Um, <laughs> like, 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 like as well. Um, and it's, it's, I think that if you ask where the future is, I think in some ways it's not far off from where cyberpunks were when I was 18 years old working at a science fiction bookstore in Toronto, putting little shelf reviews on hacker crackdown, selling boing boing off our magazine rack. Uh, it, you know, when you read those science fiction novels, they talk about giant corporations in a winner take all globalized marketplace that uh, uh, predicted and exceeded the WTO that only arose 15 years later. They talk about ubiquitous surveillance. They talk about the street finding its own use for technology. So even though they were writing in an era in which all of the interesting stuff in technology was coming from outside the establishment. You know, Mitch Capeboard tells stories about people sneaking Apple II Pluses into their workplaces so that they could run spreadsheets that parsed data out in ways that let them get their job done, but had not been approved by the uh, IT administration, who, because they were using glass teletype connected to many computers, could could dictate exactly which screens you were allowed to see and how you were allowed to see them. They were risking termination in order to pivot their spreadsheets or sort them by different characteristics than they had been intended to be sorted by. Um, when the cyberpunks talked about the street funding and so use for things, they were predicting that the establishment would absorb that kind of computing, would make it their own, and that in 25, 30, 50 years, people would be turning around again and saying, how can we take that technology back? And so for me, the interesting question is not, does the internet make us more free or less free? Because I think we've seen the internet do both of those things. The interesting question is, what do we do to make an internet that makes us more free? Right? Uh, anything less, I think, is just a council of despair. Observing that the internet can make you less free without developing a program to forestall the kinds of internet that make us less free and encourage the kinds of internet that make us more free. I don't know why you don't just kill yourself now, right? If that's your, if that's your objective, right? If that's as far as you can get, um, unless your goal is to just sell spyware to Iran, <laughs> you need to have some program about making the internet more free, which is why I got involved with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, why I think what EFF Austin is doing is important. Yeah. No. <laughs> I think it's good to act and you can act, but I'm pretty sure you're going to outlive the internet. Really. There's no need to kill yourself over such a... Such a uh, yeah, it's like killing yourself over a bulletin board system. <laughs> Do you think we're going to outgr outlive networked communication? Well, not in a strict sense, but yeah, I, I think... I, I may not outlive the descendants of the internet, and they'll probably do some stuff done with, say, the TCP Act and the protocol or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think you'll probably outlive the internet. I think you'll outlive all the software on the internet. I think you're, you're going to be surviving in the world of augmented ubiquity where, you know, the idea of the internet is, is, is laughable. It's like worrying about the telegraph. Like, oh, what about my Morse key code? Yeah, but, but we, we should worry about the telegraph because, like, today, Saber... Well, don't kill yourself. Saber's... <laughs> look at... Look at how those in perspective. Look at people who hack Saber, right? So today's Saber codes, your, all your airline reservation codes, are built off of uh, systems that were used to ingest telegraphs. They still ingest signals that originated in telegraphs. And, and uh, 
your airfare may cost five times as much or 20%, depending on how those messages are structured, because the telegraph is still buried in your aviation reservation system. I mean, I, you know, every terminal I open says TTY at the top because it's there's something in the kernel that thinks it's talking to a, a linear teletype. Uh, all of those technologies, you know, the future compost the past, right? All those technologies are, are still going to be living on. We are laying down the, the infrastructural parameters that are going to prefigure, not determine, but prefigure what all of those technologies look like. And not just, and those aren't just technological, they're also precedential. So we're building the institutions, the legal precedents, and the frameworks that are going to determine what the Internet of Things and the augmented reality of the world and the rest of the How we decide privacy works, whether privacy has a sui generis ruling, or whether privacy is, is uh, we continue to have this idiotic idea of privacy as property, so that you have a phone number, is a thing that worked out really well for the music industry. That is going to determine how we cope. That's a thing that's going to really determine how we cope with, with things like uh, augmented reality on a policy front, too. Um, I'm not convinced of that. <laughs> I mean, the architecture of these networks and the way they're governed are going to determine the architecture of other things like the financial system and even the systems of government. No, I just heard it too many times before. I mean, it's like talking about, well, it's like Hugo Gernsback talking about television, really. Uh, oh, well, whoever controls the screen is going to control the future. You know, there, there's a screen in every American home. Okay, there is a screen in every American home, but your ability to outguess what's going to happen on these, on these infrastructural fronts over a long period is really very limited. Um, I mean, things kind of rhyme with one another um, among the many things, among the many wise things Mark Frauenfelder has said. <laughs> I mean, that was to be in the front row. But uh, he, he was in Rome talking about the, uh, of, uh, the relationship between the uh, contemporary maker movement and the early electronic retail movement of, uh, of Hugo Gernsback in the early days of science fiction. And in the early days of science fiction, you had a lot of characters like Gernsback who were trying to sell a lot of electronics, but were also, you know, basically technocrats. They really thought radio was going to was going to run the world, and it was super important to like come up with, uh, you know, amateur user control over radio. And you know, and every sci-fi fan that, that that existed in the world was in was in Gernsback's circles of correspondence at the time, and they were pretty much in Gernsback's court politically. And they really wanted amateur radio to control the entire radio spectrum. And they were crushingly defeated. I mean, just annihilated politically because of all kinds of trumped up bullshit about interfering with Navy codes. You know, and, and, it, and it was all done, uh, you know, behind the circles in, uh, in Washington. And Marconi, that dirty dealer, had everything to do with it. And, you know, the rich and the powerful ended up splitting up the codes. And it, so, you know, if you were to make the same Gernsbachian argument of despair that you're making here now is like either we control the internet code or else it's all over. You would be making an argument about either we control the radio code or it's all over. It was all over. And it turns back this people were annihilated. Nobody even remembers the depth of the political struggle over control of the radio spectrum and yet life went on and in fact new things came up and now we don't really care that much. I mean spectrum's still a big deal. The fix is in and the internet in a major way. But not, not only do we have like choke points and all the, 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 the fiber optic cables and you know complete political domination in the U.S. who's, who's uh, of, of you know massive cable broadband guys who just basically bought the worst Congress in American history, <laughs> guys who do freaking nothing except sell off the national heritage. Okay, these are like facts of life, and if you allow yourself to like despair over that because you think it's never going to change it's like uh, that's like um, internalizing the defeat and it's not even historically true and who says it's never going to change the point is how can we change it right how can we use well you can change it as much as you want it's just in the long term you've got to like live with unexpected developments <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you've just got to accept that you're not in full command of every political, ethical, legal, and social thing in the world. I mean, I'm really sorry about Ross Ulbricht. I wish he didn't. I wish he hadn't done what he did. But I understand perfectly well that his line of thinking comes directly from stuff that, you know, my friends and I are writing novels about many years ago. I mean, we didn't create him, but we've like opened up a space in which people like him can 
can he be? You know, and he has a right to be, even if he's going to be in prison probably for the rest of his natu natural life. And, you know, and, and to deny that kind of fact isn't a counsel of despair. It's like a blindness to the tragedy of the human condition. You know? like, <laughs> people actually screw up. You know, they like do really bad things. It's like, you know, you you can't. Um, you can't deny us that aspect of our humanity because it's uh, it prunes away something. So I, I don't know exactly what you're advocating, Bruce. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll tell you. Not killing yourself. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Uh, well, you know, I think your problem is you're suffering from solutionism. <laughs> well, that's, that's the modern. That's the modern term. I've heard that term. It's a literary. It's a literary solutionist debate, and you know, and I could take either side of those. But you know, the longer I go, the more I realize. The more I realize that the solutions don't stick. You know, the street does find its own uses for things, and a new generation, you know, has its own take on matters, and it doesn't believe that you've solved anything. Now, you know, I used to meet with people who say, oh yeah, Mr. Sorley, read your book, so-and-so, you know, I read it 14 times, and uh, I was really inspired by one of the ideas in it, and by golly, I've got one right here in this cardboard box. <laughs> and, you know, and he would bring out the thing in the cardboard box, and sometimes it was even named after some gadget I had made up, but it was never what I had thought up. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, rarely was it even close. You know, because the guy had gone through some kind of tech development and he like figured out how to sell it or he thought he was going to be able to sell it. And the, and the process of translating something from, you know, a kind of brief offhand, vaguely metaphysical sci-fi description into something that looked like it would fit in the marketplace had actually changed it radically. Uh, so, you know, usually I would, I mean, at first I was like really flattered. I was like, oh, that's great. You should read more of my books. Okay. <laughs> that, that lasted maybe five years. You know, and then after that I would try to like gently warn him a little bit about how hard it is to actually sell stuff. But nowadays when that happens, I would tend to say something like, how long do you think that'll last? No. Oh. Right? Which is, you know, to say that if you predict the future and enough time passes, you've predicted the past. <laughs> And I predicted a lot of the past, like a whole lot of the past. And as time goes, I will, I will have predicted nothing but the past, right? And all this, you know, alleged future that I was talking about merely becomes part of, you know, like Gernsback's future. But, it's a but historical Bruce, artifact. stuff happens and it means something. I mean, the fact that it's in the past doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It doesn't mean that it didn't mean something. It doesn't mean that people didn't act the, the in order meaning, to cause it to happen. It the, doesn't the, mean... the meanings are not permanent. Well, they're socially constructed. Of course they are. But but well, there, are past, there are past past in which there are future past in which people are happy and there are future past in which people are sad. There are future past in which people are being killed in Maiden, and there are future past in which they have other means by which to address their grievances. Well, you know, there there are past where the word cyberpunk was super important. And then there are present days when you can just accept it as a cultural artifact. There's a literary movement that had like seven years of, you know, cutting edge whateverness, and then the, you know, the people who were like super involved in it split off and they went in their separate ways. Now, if you're like really hung up on the idea that cyberpunk is some kind of permanent cultural solution to a problem, at that point it's like a tragedy. It's like, oh, he's not doing it anymore, or, you know, well, their I, dream I, was disturbed. I don't know that anyone, that anyone particularly feels that way. I think, you know, <laughs> I think people, there, there are people who are fans of cyberpunk who are, like, upset by that, like contemporary Tumblr cyberpunks. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are super nostalgic about it. I mean, they're really, like, stuck in an 80s, you know, 8-bit aesthetic, which is, you know, all about shapely chicks with chrome. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and and, and, it, and it harms them in some ways. I mean, they're not being liberated by... Did you tumble a bunch of BBS login screens this afternoon? I did. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely did, because, you know, we need to look at those and recognize that we are the people who are perpetrating today's BBS login screens. We are by no means any more sophisticated than people who are doing BBS login screens. We're merely creating the BBS login, login screens now of the 2040s. Yeah. Everything that we're doing now is every bit as naive as stuff that was thought about in the 1980s or 1990s. More naive in some ways because in the 80s and 90s there was a lot more maneuvering leeway. We didn't have a, po a paralyzed Congress. We didn't have a civil cold war. We didn't have unnecessary invasions 
uh, you know, of foreign countries didn't have blatant wars for oil going on. Well, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Grenada was a flat out land grab. It's like Putin, you know, an annexing South Ossetia. I mean, you know. It was the, pe the people were not naive, but the problem is that when you're like back projecting that stuff and saying, oh, they merely had BBS login screens, it merely gives you a superior feeling for what's going on now, and it blinds you to your own historical experience. You're every bit as temporary as that. Now that the Internet's going, not going to last forever. And oh, no, Bitcoin's not going to last forever. And oh, don't, don't buy into that. There is no one future. No, the future is like the past. It's like talking about the 18th century, the 17th, 16th, 15th, 14th, 12th, as if they were all one undifferentiated entity. That's not how time actually works. That's not how language works. That's not how technology works, design, ethics, sociology, metaphysics. They all change. And the only way you like get out of there is like opening your veins because you've like given up metaphysically because you face some particular temporary political defeat. It's bad. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Ross Ulbricht immolated himself. He's like going out there on absolute extreme libertarian principles. It's like me, Bitcoin, or death. You know, like Bitcoin or death. Okay, that's great, Ross. What do you plan to do now? I think I'll kill six other guys. Because they're in the way of my scheme. I they're between me and history. I think there's some some room between Council of Despair or Bitcoin or Death, where in which, <laughs> in which you make a technology like you say, uh, improve the UI for OTR, or uh, um, help build Internet in a Box stuff to, to drop into places where the Internet's been cut off because there's been an effective popular uprising. I think there there's there's some there's some breathing room in there. Yeah. I would agree. That's, That's, like the space. Not... <laughs> That's the space I think we need to inhabit. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, into, I'm, I'm making more of a, a Carl Chopek argument here. You know? But uh, probably it's because I'm older than you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing a lot of, hey, you kids, get off my lawn. <laughs> I don't think so at all. I mean, on the contrary, what I'm arguing is make room for tomorrow's kids and stop making yourself dad. Hey, we should uh, we should take a few minutes because we're we got like ten or twelve minutes left uh, for questions. I know there's probably questions out there. I see one. Bring the mic, Keith. Here's your red. Uh, in conversation with a friend uh, about a year or so ago. He said an interesting thing to me, which, and he was, you know, and this, this gets to what you guys have been talking about for the last 45 minutes or so. Um, he said, I don't know, sometimes I just kind of feel like science fiction is there to soften the blow. <laughs> and I thought about it, and I thought, well, okay, and we then started talking about things like design fiction and things like Corey was talking about the responsibility of fiction authors, if we want to look at it that way, because it has not always been looked at that way, to write towards future you want to see, you know, and I wonder what you guys think of that. First, the first part, it seems like science fiction is anymore there just to soften the blow, and then the second part, if or if not that's the case, then, then what do we do as writers or as readers? You want to handle that? Well, I think in part it's there to help you prepare for the imminent pain more than to soften the blow, than to imagine darker futures or to imagine the kind of the ugliness that's inevitably coming in some respects or, but uh, it's a laboratory for experimenting with better presence more than sort of imagining some sort of utopian future and it's a much more kind of near term thing that kind of steps out a little bit further to create a little bit more uh, I don't know breathing room for that kind of uh, experimentation where the you know, it's about character and it's about all of those things that a story's about, but it's also about the novel or the story or the design extrapolation as a kind of narrative laboratory for thinking about how to make a better place to live in, kind of to Corey's points, I think. I think it's at best it plucks a single element out of the contemporary world whose effect is very diffused. Uh, and hard to put your finger on. It's hard to, to, to get a sense of how much things have changed 
as a result of this technology or how much that technology has become integrated in the way you live. And you build this contrafactual world in which it's the one sort of, you know, totalizing fact of that world, a kind of world in a bottle. Like I compare it sometimes to like a doctor swabbing your throat and putting it in a petri dish and growing a world that's not a model of, of what's going on in your body. It's, it's a kind of uh, ship in a bottle model where, where there's only one fact about your body that matters and that's whatever was growing in the back of your throat. And you leave it for a weekend and you can come back and look at it and, and say something about your body, not because you can accurately model your body, your body but because you have uh, built a, a, a distorted model that emphasizes the one thing you want to see. And I think at its best, science fiction can tease one element out and blow it up into this world that then helps us think about that one element in our contemporary lives. Um, you know, I, when, when I hear arguments like that, I'm reminded of the history of Soviet science fiction, which I think did sort of exist to soften the blow in many ways. And you know, it, it was kind of a consolatory genre that sort of said, well, you know, there's no bread today and there's no bread yesterday, but someday we'll have bread and there will also be jam. <laughs> and, and, you know, and yet I think we've we've lost a lot of valuable science fiction writing because you know the Soviet Union and its entire political ideology was discredited. And I even talked to uh, one of the Strugatsky brothers uh, one time. I was asking about his early work in science fiction. He was, he was expressing his sorrow that he'd written them as a Marxist. And he thought that they were worthless. And uh, I was very moved. <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I felt that although he'd, he'd sort of been trying to, he'd been trying to encourage people in his own society to sort of think larger than the daily oppression of Soviet life, when his, when his society had fallen, he couldn't soften the blow for himself, right? I mean, he, he'd actually sort of given up on, on his own oeuvre. And, you know, I, I don't want that to happen. Uh, you know, I, I find that a dreadful prospect. But you know, I, I, nobody ever accuses me of softening blows in particular, even when I go way out of my way to try and find the you know, upside of a particular situation. And on the contrary, you know, as a cyberpunk, I sometimes have been accused of corrupting the young and you know, actually making things worse by writing about dark prospects and sort of laying open things that would would be better left unspoken. And, uh, you know, romanticizing computer crime in the early 80s is, a, is a, you know, a problem that can be laid at the doorstep of us cyberpunks because we thought that hackers were cute. And at the time, they were kind of cute. I mean, they broke into systems, but they didn't do much. Whereas contemporary hackers who were carrying out, say, the very lively Ukrainian-Russian cyber war that's going on right now, are nobody's friends, even if they read tons of sci-fi. Okay, they're not nice guys, and yeah. um, you know, and, and the, the 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 modern day computer underground is not the underground of Frack magazine or 2600. These are people with hundreds of millions of dollars and major support from intelligence agencies and full state support and extremely sophisticated and very sinister, specifically designed programs that are like the Quang virus out of one of Gibson's early novels only wandering around loose inside Iranian nuclear purification plants. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, we, we didn't soften the blow in that regard. I, you know, and, and, and even predicting that it would happen didn't seem to slow it down. On the contrary, I'm thinking that predicting that ha predicting it would happen or talking about the power that was that was possibly inherent in these things may have accelerated that development. Right? Uh, it may not have necessarily been a wise thing for us to do, even though we were in the business of writing thriller novels. And you know, if the book isn't thrilling, nobody's going to read it. I don't think there's a computer underground. I think there are multiple computer undergrounds. Well, there 2600 certainly are continue, now, yeah. continues, right? And, and actually, the weird thing about 2600 is not that it's gotten smaller. It's gotten much bigger. Hope is much bigger. DEF CON is much bigger. Those computer undergrounds have swollen at the same time as they've been eclipsed by even bigger ones made up of, of you know, stoops and criminals and whatnot. I think I'm going to go to Moscow in a couple of weeks, maybe <laughs> three or four, to be at a, a Russian hacker convention. 
which is, you know, I was invited there by some guy who's a fan of my books. I've never heard of him. I'm like, look, you can't possibly get me a Russian visa. You know, it's going to take like a month and a half to get it. I was blow, blowing him off. And I was like, oh, I enjoyed meeting you at that sci-fi meeting, but I, I can't possibly go hang out with your friends to discuss Russian computer crime activities in Moscow. He's like, oh, I, I think we could probably arrange to get you a visa, Mr. Sterling. And we'll fly you over here first class. I said, can I interview Anna Chapman? He said, we'll make an effort. <laughs> I'm going to go. <laughs> but, you know, it's not, it's not going to be, you know, potato pancakes over there. This is going to be a serious situation. It's already a such serious situation. They freaking subverted the Ukraine and bit off a chunk of it. We've got a question back here. So, with, it's a song. with the recognition that you have sort of like had this precognition or predictive or model of the future that you, you created and, and, and uh, communicated to the rest of the world, how have you responded emotionally to watching the effects of that appear in the real world over time? And how has that impacted you and the way that you look at and, and, and the way that you uh, want to communicate these things going forward, I mean. Okay, well, you know, if, if you're aiming that at me as the, maybe the oldest guy on the panel, I don't know. I mean, at least the guy yeah. who's predicted, <laughs> the guy who's predicted more than other people. Okay, you know, I used to find that quite flattering, but um, now I'm actually more interested in, like, friends of mine doing stuff that turns out to be really hairy. Like, uh, you know, the maker scene is of great interest to me. And I'm not particularly worried about people predicting stuff out of my 1988 novel, Islands in the Net, even though we've got islands in the net all over the place. And the first chapter has a guy killed by a drone. <laughs> that was written before anybody had ever been killed by drones. Okay, I'm about as happy about that as I'm ever going to get. Whereas, <laughs> and I'm, Whereas, like, having things in Cory Doctorow's novels come true is, like, really scary. <laughs> <laughs> and having, like, Mark Fraunfelder start weird stapled magazines from some anonymous engineer in Colorado that turn out to be bigger than the fucking New York Times <laughs> on the Internet, that's also very scary. <laughs> hey, we're almost out of time here. I was wondering, uh, do you guys have closing remarks. Do you have anything you want to say before we shut down? There wasn't enough time, really, but it never is. Yara? Um, I don't know. Just listening to everything uh, tonight, uh, a couple of things came to mind for me. I've always been a big fan of the John Gilmore quote. The internet reads censorship as damage and routes around it. So when we're thinking about the, you know, like the NSA and net neutrality and all of the the issues that are sort of threatening the potential for that to, to happen, uh, that's just sort of an open question for me, because as long as there's the capability for that rerouting, I'm pretty comfortable. Uh, it starts to uh, uh, you know, vaporize. It, it, it gets scary to think of, of uh, the, the sort of depth of networking uh, technology. And then I, I ended in my book, Jamming the Media, with a Tim Leary quote. If you don't like the music they're playing, pick up your needle and move it to a, to a different groove. And again, with this ability to reroute, there's always the capability. If you don't like what's happening in, in culture or whatever, as long as you have that ability to pick up the needle, which again gets into the maker culture and the whole idea of the continuing idea of DIY going all the way back to the whole Earth catalog and post-World War II uh, DIY ethos, uh, which is something that's always been a good line for me. I'm always focused on DIY culture as the place I want to put my energy. So again, it's just sort of an open question. It's not really a conclusion. But in thinking about the idea of where cyberpunk has gone, where cyber culture has gone, uh, and where all of that may continue, as long as those capabilities are there, I'm happier than if I think they're all going to dry up and, and all of all of that uh, activity is, is uh, you know, doesn't have a future. I like that Gilmore quote too, but it's important to remember that Gilmore didn't rely on the internet to mystically route around censorship, that he, right, exactly. the way that the internet routed around censorship in Gilmore's world is you found it in ISP. 
that had a free speech ethos. And then when the law threatened that you founded a civil liberties group that uh, helped keep the laws good and, and free and open in respect to the internet. So uh, I do think the internet can interpret censorship as damage and right around it, provided we remember that we are what made the internet right, and yeah. we, we can help it route around it. We, we will steer it. Um, you know, I don't really like reminiscing about stuff because it has the foretaste of death to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, it's something that's like necessary, but there's also just something parochial about it. You know? I mean, in any time is sort of equivalent to any other. And I was happy to see, uh, you know, so many mentions of Art Bite here. There's a magazine from the early 90s that uh, Mark Proud, um, that uh, Mark Derry used to. Uh, is to edit out of New York, because I think it's one of the many unexplored byways that was present in sort of the corpus of cyber, American cyber culture at the time. Uh, I, I think there's like unfinished business with that. It was, it was one of these things that was ahead of its time and really has not blossomed. And it was a, you know, it was a, it was a magazine of cyber culture which was critical and artistic rather than business-oriented or power-oriented or a civil libertarian man. And uh, I think uh, you know there are aspects of our society that have not been touched by what's gone on. And I think there's, a, there's kind of a lot of living coal under the embers and the ashes of things that happened 20 or, or 30 years ago. There's, there, are, there are many unexplored byways there. Uh, and uh, if you're too nostalgic about it, and you sort of like, Put on this remote gloss in it, you won't understand, you know, the, the sort of human energies that lie there and how they can like be re be revived, you know, under different circumstances with more power. And the way that like the maker scene is a bigger deal than Hugo Gernsback's Radio Parts catalog, <clears throat> or even though they're very similar and they exist in a very similar kind of demographic. There's just sometimes the time is right and you can throw the same seeds and get a tremendous crop. But you'll never get it if you fossilize the past and try to preserve it in a glass vitrine. You need to engage with the past with some sense of human solidarity and with an awareness that you're a part of that same rich pageant. I was thinking about Gareth's talk before ours, and it's something we didn't talk about much, about how important cyberpunk and cyberculture is for sort of creating room to explore different iterations or conceptions of self and kind of boundaries between, you know, Cartesian boundaries between mind and body, boundaries between the self and the network. And I think there's probably a lot of unfinished business there or unexplored opportunity to sort of think about, uh, you know, the kind of the toughest literary challenge is sort of breaking out of the idea of the Cartesian self that sort of so confines all of that and that it seems like the thing that's really trying to happen. Thanks. You guys are just getting on. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lubkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.